everybody. Uh, my name is Erica Mason. I work at Third Love as a data scientist. And before I get going, I just wanted to get, take a quick poll. How many people in the audience are data scientists? OK. So I just want you all to think back to a time that you built some really great model. You validated it, and it was doing everything you wanted it to do. All of the metrics were looking really great. And then nothing happened with it. It just stayed on your laptop or in a Git repo. It never got to where you needed it to be in terms of in the hands of people who were going to use it. And it just stayed on your laptop. So this story, empowering business partners to make model-based marketing decisions, is really just a story about how last year when I built a model, I wanted to make sure that that didn't happen, that I could get the model into the hands of the decision makers in a very lightweight way with few resources. Um, and before I get into that, I wanted to take another poll. Has anyone here th heard of Third Love? Oh, okay, more than I expected. Um, so Third Love is an e-commerce company, and for those of you who don't know, we sell bras. Um, so we are part retail, part tech company, and we're based out of San Francisco. We have about 100 people working in our San Francisco office, but we also have a pretty big office here in Cordoba of, of around 50 uh, engineers, software engineers, data engineers, and product managers. And the reason that I, um, and that may seem like a lot of people for just selling bras, but it's actually pretty complicated. So this is our whole product life cycle from you know, marketing to sourcing the bras from our factories. And the reason that I say that we're part retail, part tech company is that we use tech and data to give insights for each stage of this process to make it as effective as possible. Um, and we have actually a team of 10 data scientists working on improving these processes, and we're focused on three main areas within Third Love. That's product, marketing, and then inventory and operations. The product data science team is really focused on providing data products to our website. Um, this includes the fit, our Fit Finder recommendation algorithm that recommends a bra size. We also have style ranking and other site personalization, as well as A-B testing. And then our marketing data science team, which I'm gonna focus a little bit more on today, focuses on making sure that every dollar we spend on marketing is as efficient as possible. And then finally, our inventory and operations team, their main uh, focus right now is projecting and forecasting demand at the SKU level so that we can buy our inventory um, in an optimal way. So I was working on the marketing data science team last year, and I want to tell you a little bit about one of the problems, the main problem we were focused on. So as I said, we're an e-commerce company. We're primarily driven by performance marketing. And what this means is we spend a lot of money on digital marketing channels like Facebook or Google. And these are pretty straightforward to measure in general because we know how many people see these ads, we know how many people click through, and how many people finally make an order with these ads. Um, but we also do other things. So for example, we have offline marketing. We market on podcasts and we market on traditional TV. This gets a lot harder to measure because we don't have clicks anymore. And then we do other crazier stuff, or not crazy, just old school stuff, like um, putting ads in newspapers and magazines, and also we send out little postcards to people in the mail. So once you have all these different marketing methods, it becomes really hard to measure the impact of any of these channels and hard to determine where we should be allocating our money. So this was the problem we were facing, and as data scientists, what did we do? We built a model. Um, so our input was the amount of marketing spend we were spending in each of these marketing channels at different time points. And our response variable was our orders over time. And that sounds pretty straightforward, but there were a lot of issues we had to deal with. The fact that this is time series data, so we had to deal with seasonality and trend and autocorrelation. Also with this marketing data, um, we had to deal with the fact that there's diminishing returns. The more we spend in any of these channels, the less efficient we get as we start to saturate our audience. There's also synergistic effects between these channels that we had to deal with. Um, and I actually am not really want to get into too much how we solved this model, um, but this is the functional, uh, 
the, the model that we fit. And I actually documented how we solved this, how we validated our model um, in our blog, and also wrote a white paper about it and talked about some common gotchas that you deal with in building these media mix models. But what I really want to talk today about today is what we did with this model next. So we had this model. As I said, it was great. We did back tests. We validated it with experimental data. We felt like it was really ready to start being used by our marketing partners who could use it uh, to make decisions. And they were excited about it too. They you know, had been shooting in the dark and wanted to understand how, effect, how they should be spending more effect efficiently. The problem was that there was no way for them to interact with this model. Um, they just didn't, it was all in uh, scripts on my laptop and they had no way to you know, ask it questions. So what did we do? They asked me <laughs> and I would run scripts. So <laughs> I was just standing in the middle between the marketing team and this model as a go-between. They would ask me questions, I would run scenarios and um, get back to them as very iterative and time consuming. And this was obviously not a great solution, not scalable at all. It became very clear that we needed to build some sort of tool for them to interact with this model. So once that was clear, we just had to figure out what should this tool, what should go into this tool, how are we gonna do it? What, does, what are the key things that need to be included for them to get what they needed out of it? And um, you know, at the time, this was over a year ago, we were a pretty small company and all of our engineering and product management resources were really focused on our website, making our website as efficient as possible, you know, getting people through that funnel to make an order. We didn't have people focused on internal tools so it's clear that it was up to the data science team to provide this tool to the marketing team. Um, so I'm not a product manager, but the two questions I was thinking at the time were how am I gonna do this and what needs to go in there? Um, so first, focusing on the how, I started Googling and I started talking to colleagues and people in the community and three frameworks really bubbled up as platforms that data scientists use to build kind of interactive dashboards um, and visualizations. And those three were Dash by Plotly, Boca, and Shiny. Uh, for me, I ruled out Shiny right away because I'm a Python person and I wouldn't be here presenting about it if I didn't know. Um, and then between the other two, uh, I just did a lot of research and I don't work for any of these companies, but I ended up working with Dash and there were a few things that I liked about it. Um, firstly, it's built on a Flask backend, which I knew our um, engineering team was already familiar with, so I knew I could get help with deployment later on. The other thing I liked is that it's kind of a direct translation from HTML into Python, so if you're familiar with HTML, you don't have to relearn anything. There's a very small learning curve. Um, it also plugs in directly with Plotly visualizations, which I had used before, and I also found that the getting started guide was really great. So that for me at the time was just the tool that I thought was best for the job. And then what should go into this tool? What are the questions that the marketing team need answered? And there were a lot of things we could have done with this model. We can assess past performance, we can predict into the future, but really the question they wanted to know and it kept coming up time and time again is how much money should we be spending in each channel? And not only that, but they added a lot of caveats like oh, by the way, you can't spend that much money in this channel, they, they, they don't have the capacity for that. Or we don't actually have a TV commercial that's gonna be ready next quarter, so we can't spend in TV. Or, oh, we already bought the paper for our postcards, so we have to spend this much. Um, so these were the kinds of questions I was getting over and over again, and this brought me back to my time at university studying operations research because it reminded me of a constrained optimization problem. So how can I, I needed to figure out how can I turn those questions I was being asked into an optimization problem that we can solve. So here we formulated that into an optimization problem where X is the amount of money that we spend in each marketing channel and then we want to maximize our total orders this formula here is the same model that we were using before to fit, to fit based on our data. And now we're using those parameters that we fit as constants and solving for the spend. And then we have a set of constraints. We said that each channel has a certain budget and that in total we can only spend a certain amount of money. 
And again, the question became, how are we going to solve this in Python? How am I going to put this into my Dash application? And that's where uh, CVXPy comes in. Again, I don't work for this or am affiliated in any way, but it's a package that I use that I really liked and I want to share. Um, so CVXPy was developed at Stanford by a research group there, and their tagline is convex optimization for everyone. Um, so the things I really like about it is as long as you have an optimization problem that fits into this convex optimization framework, um, which we do, this is the objective function there is a convex function as long as those beta parameters add up to less than one and we have linear constraints. We can formulate, and all we have to do is formulate that function pretty much in NumPy syntax, throw it into, um, throw it into an objective function, define our constraints, put that into this CVXPy problem object and solve using any solver you want. So what I liked is the math and the code look really similar and it's very straightforward. I don't know to know how it's being solved. So given that, I wanted to just quickly show you the demo of what we built for the marketing team. Um, and this is just a toy example of the first version we built, but basically we were able to give them something where they can put in their budget to be optimized a month that they want to uh, optimize for, and then um, a, a table where they can input constraints for each of the channels. And then they can also specify things like how much do we think av the average order value is going to be, what do we think the return rate is going to be, how many bras do we have in stock this month, um, say it's 40, and then CVXPy runs the optimization, we get an output of our total orders, gross revenue, net revenue, and our return on ad spend. And then down here is what they really cared about, which is the optimized spend by channel. And um, it gives us an indication of how much we should be spending in each channel, what the model thinks is the average cost and average and marginal cost of each of these um, marketing inputs. And then here are these plotly visualizations that um, you know, this one is just to show what we should expect the gross revenue to be every day so that they can tell if they're on target and then the, just the overall breakdown of how much the model thinks we should be spending in each channel. And what was great about this was because I, they could run this optimization and then they could look at the results and say, oh, well, $500,000 in marketing channel D, that's not possible, there's no way we can spend that much, we'll oversaturate our audience. So they could just go in right away and maybe change it to 300,000 um, and have it re-optimize and reallocate the money without having you know me in the middle going back and forth on email. So I just wanna show you a little bit of some of those features that I showed you what the code looks like. Um, so that table where I could edit and input any numbers I want. All that is is pulling in this dash data table component, initializing it with a pandas data frame and setting editable equal to true and then doing a few style things. And you can see like um, the other code, we're using divs and headers similar to HTML. That's what I was talking about when I say it's a direct translation from HTML into Python. Same thing with these sliders, it's super easy. You just are importing this dash core component slider object and initializing it. And then the pie chart as well, you're just uh, feeding it into these ready to go core comp uh, components that dash has. And this example I showed you is pretty simple. You can do a lot cooler stuff with dash. So one more thing, um, if you're paying attention closely, I started talking about how this is all about getting the model into the hands of our marketing partners. but really all I've been talking about now is developing an application locally on my laptop. Um, so we had to uh, call in the big guns at this point, uh, which was our data engineering team. Um, so we called in this guy, Marcos, who's sitting right there. And he's from Cordova, our Cordova team, and he went to university here, just for background. And basically what he did was he took my uh, Dash application, which that back end was in Flask, he integrated Amazon Cognito with it for authorization and authentication so that only certain people in our company could log on with their third love email addresses. He put that into a Docker image and hosted it on Heroku. 
And that was great. So we had this application. We had it um, at a URL that people could log into safely and securely and run any scenarios they wanted. Um, but the question here now became, so what? Like, what did this actually give us as a company? Um, and the first thing that it gave us was really just a shared understanding of how the model worked. When I was sitting between our business partners and the model, um, you know, running scenarios with me in the loop, it didn't give them time to interact with the model itself. And so they didn't have an intuition of how it worked. It was really just a black box that spat things out. Once they were able to play with it themselves, they had a much better intuition of what inputs caused what outputs, how the whole thing was working. And this really created like a magic moment where they were able to start giving me feedback on my model. So as marketing experts, they know a lot more about marketing than I do, and they could tell if something was wrong. Um, so the first thing was easy. Like they could just give me feedback on bugs. Like if something wasn't working, we were able to move a lot faster once I had more eyes working on this project. But the other thing was they were also able to challenge key assumptions that I was making in my model. Um, an example of this is that at first when I built this, um, we included a channel called branded search. And this channel is basically if someone types in third love into a search engine, like Google or Bing or whatever search engine, and then we pay for Google to show our ad at the top. And that only ha this is branded, so it's only if they type in third love. So people who type in third love into search engines already know about us. They're looking for our website. They're very high intent, and they're very likely to make an order. So originally, my model thought this channel was the best thing ever. It was um, trying to, when, we, when it came to optimization, it was telling us to spend 75% you know, of our spend in branded search. And this just isn't even possible, because we can't spend in this channel unless someone types our name into the, into the search engine, and people don't type your name into the search engine unless you're advertising on other channels. So it was just flawed, um, a flawed assumption that we should include it, and we ended up taking it, taking it out of the model. And because it was highly correlated with the spend in other channels, this ended up improving our model performance as well. Um, the other thing that happened with this shared understanding was that the marketing partners were able to trust us a lot, or trust the model a lot more. When they had an intuition of how it worked, when the model spat out something crazy, they weren't just dismissing it right away. They you know, would try and figure out, why is it doing that? What are the limitations here? Either give me feedback on they, if they thought something was wrong, or use the constraints to just account for something that they knew the model couldn't account for. And that was really great because at first when it was more of a black box, if it just spat out something crazy, they would be like, okay, well, we can't use this anymore because it sucks. So that was great. And then the other thing that this model, having the model available to them to interact with was that it really fostered more of a testing culture within our marketing team. So our marketing team always was testing within channels. So for example, with Facebook, they would always be testing, okay, is this ad set better than this ad set? Doing A-B testing that way. But this model kind of reoriented all of us to be thinking about what is the value of spend in, in Facebook at all, or any channel at all. So it started us to reorient around holdout tests where we would have, you know, our control groups wouldn't be a different ad set, it would be not showing ads at all so that we could really measure the incremental value of each of these channels. And one of the reasons this actually started is because this model would spit out, don't spend any money in some channels. And this is where I have to give major kudos to the marketing team because, you know, imagine you're in charge of um, a certain channel and then a data scientist comes along and tells you, hey, the channel that you've spent the last year trying to optimize um, isn't worth anything. It's not driving orders at all. I mean, that's a lot to take, but our marketing team was able to take that and then devise tests to validate whether that was true, not just take the model's output at face value, but devise tests to validate whether it's true, and then iterate from there. And this actually led to the marketing team um, 
uh, completely cutting spend in actually two channels last year and drastically reducing spend in another channel. Um, so that was really cool to see that we were actually, you know, making data-driven decisions um, as a company. And that's, we, once we did that, we were immediately able to drive more efficiency. And that was really the value of this model, is that once we drove more efficiency, we were able to um, sell more bras, which is our goal, and provide women all over the US, um, you know, their perfect fit. And so the real takeaway here is not anything about marketing or these two um, packages I talked about or anything like that, but the takeaway here is that getting a good model into the hands of decision makers is way more a valuable use of your time than trying to eke out like one more percentage of accuracy or some other metric. So I think I went through that pretty fast, um, but if you have any questions. Hi, hello. Um, thank you for your talk. Uh, I completely agree that the, the key point in here is how to put your models in the hands of the correct people. But I still don't understand about that, so I'm going to ask you a technical question. Mm -hmm. um, when you're using this visualization um, tool, what's the trade-off between how much you can modify your visualization versus how standardized is the, is the libraries? kind of like between Seaborn, Matplotlib, uh, in that spectrum, uh, where is it? I think it definitely depends on what you're trying to do. For us, the visualization wasn't the most important thing. It was really being able to have an, a tool where they could input any inputs they wanted for constraints and spit that out. The I think that in this case, the dashboard would have been just as effective if we didn't even have any visualizations at all. Um, but it definitely depends case by case. Hello, thanks for the presentation. Uh, so it was a really cool uh, tool for the marketing team to take decisions. Uh, but I was thinking like the next step is probably them validating if the decision was like the correct one. So let's say if you predict that the gross revenues would be X, they need to check if the decision actually made the gross revenues to be X. Uh, do you have like any integration between the this decision platform and maybe monitoring if the decisions and the performance were as expected? How do you deal with that? That's a great question, um, and we're always trying to improve on that. Um, the different ways we validate this model are a few things. One, we do back tests, so we hold out our months of data and predict on it. The other thing we do is uh, with our experimental data at the channel level for holdout tests, um, we get an, um, a cost per incremental acquisition from those holdout tests, and we compare that to what the model is spitting out at the channel level. But then you have an, another great point, like what about holistically when we're predicting this allocation? Is that actually providing the gross revenue we think? Um, and the question, the answer is we don't have like an automated validation built into the tool yet, but I think that's a great idea. The other problem is there, a lot of stuff comes up day to day in terms of marketing and just business trends. So even if, um, it's not exactly right, we can still say that it's a good tool because, for example, say like we have a big article come out about us that totally changes what our gross revenue is going to be. But we do use those back tests to try and validate the model. And the other thing is we don't know, we don't have like a counterfactual of what would have happened had we not used these um, spend recommendations. But um, and I didn't mention this, we have actually been able to increase our marketing budget from last year to this year by 40% while increasing our return on ad spend. And this is really um, difficult to do because normally when you scale your marketing, you become less efficient because you're reaching a broader audience and you're reaching diminishing returns. 
So between this tool, and it's not just this tool, it's other efforts that have been done by our data science marketing team, um, we've been able to beat that trend and scale our program while um, increasing return. But yeah, I think that's a great point to actually integrate it into the tool. Hi, thank you for the talk. Uh, I'm going to add uh, more on this technical side question. Uh, do you need to retrain the model from time to time? And how do you handle that? It's automated in some way, or, or do you need to, to retrain it yourself and then publish it? Yes, yeah, so we need to retrain this model about once a month, just because the trend terms of like how the business is doing um, really affect the model. So the way that we, we retrain it and we run back tests every month and then redeploy it to the tool. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Thank you. Um, I have a question. Um, are you familiar with R Markdown? Do you know? Okay. Yes. I, I, I wish there was something like R Markdown in Python. And I've been considering learning Dash as an alternative to it, but it, the way you make it sound, it's like it's more like developing a whole app, uh, a web application or something. But could could it be a, an option if you have um, like a like a Jupyter notebook or a Python uh, script that you can just sort of pop it up and show it in a, in a way that, or is it in, an involved process? I would say from what I was using it for, so I'm oriented that I was using it for this application, so I'm not 100% sure you couldn't, but I would say it's probably not the best tool for that because it is really more focused around building an application. Okay, thanks, that helps. But anyone can challenge that here. 